talking is forward uh, to today, and by today I mean where I wanted to get at uh, several minutes ago, which was that repo market rate spike in October of 2019. What was that a, a an evidence of in your mind? What was the signal that I think went under the radar for a lot of people, and especially after uh, a few months later, we were drowned with COVID and hmm. everything that happened since then. So I think a lot of what was happening then got sort of swept under the rug, and not a lot of people were able to pay atten- the the proper attention to it. T bills, right, Emil? <laughs> It's just <laughs> lack of T bills, lack of available T bills. Yeah, well, but why were they being hoovered up? That, I wanted to bring that up earlier. Adam was asking a question about uh, the Fed buying Treasury bills and putting a floor under them. But then there's a problem if they're buying the wrong ones, right? And that's what we saw in March of 2020 because of what happened in September in 2019 thereafter. But go ahead, Jeff. So the short answer is that there were any number of warning signs that dealers were becoming risk averse, that collateral was becoming short, and therefore dealers had to constrain their own balance sheet activities, which we depend upon these dealers to act in the monetary system. And so when it became, you remember the yield curve inverted late August 2019, which is a very powerful signal that things were going wrong. Dealers were becoming risk averse. You saw your bonds as collateral, collateral swaps, repo fails, any number of indications that told you the system was relatively fragile. Then you had this point in mid-September 2019 where we had what was essentially called backwards elasticity, which as the interest rate rose in the repo market, the cash rate rose for GC collateral in the repo market, that should trigger dealers coming flying in because they can make their whole year on a fat, juicy repo rate on a single day. But yet they looked at that repo rate and said, that's risk. And so they stepped further and further and further back and the repo market just went under because dealer risk aversion, all these liquidity risks and all these other factors on their balance sheet said, we're not jumping into this repo market at any price. That's backwards elasticity. It had nothing to do with the level of bank reserves because all, all the banks told the Fed very privately, very quietly, we have ample bank reserves. What they lacked was the willingness and ability to act on their own balance sheets. And for a number of reasons that, you know, we've talked about some of them, some of them here, but essentially risk aversion. If dealers are not willing to do these activities, they break down and then they create these self-reinforcing cycles. And as Emil was just alluding to, the Federal Reserve acted exactly the opposite way they should have. Because you have this collateral shortfall that pre-existed in September 2019, causing all sorts of liquidity problems. What does the Fed do? The Fed steps in and takes the best of the best collateral out of the marketplace. They even called it not QE and intentionally bought treasury bills. And I don't think we specified that before, but treasury bills are the absolute top of the top of the top of the collateral list. And here you have the Fed buying treasury bills after September of 2019. So that as as Emil and I had warned all throughout that period, 2019 into 2020, the Fed is doing the worst thing they could possibly do, which is take the best collateral out of circulation. And lo and behold, what happened in March 2020? Yes, it got lost into the shuffle of COVID. Everybody was worried about lockdowns and diseases and pandemic and government reactions, everything else. But in a technical sense, we had another massive collateral shortage where the Fed had removed 342 or 346 billion in treasury bills from the marketplace because it misunderstood what happened in the in the September before. So when they remove these treasury bills from the marketplace, why doesn't this this is going to I'm sort of thinking through this and I'm not sure how mechanically this might might be the case, but it seems to me if you're removing a let's call it a good or a demand instrument from the market that has extremely high demand at the margin, you're driving up the price of those treasury bills and that the, the price, they, the price would have to rise enough so that the value of that collateral will meet the, man, the demand for that collateral, right? So, I mean, in theory, the, the Fed can remove, you know, all the T-bills and the value of the remaining T-bills would, would, would effectively go to infinity because they would be, you know, in, in, in such demand, right? Is it like a, if it, is it the fact that they're not infinitely divisible that that mean, that means it, it can't adjust like that? Like it just, I don't understand why the supply demand 
curve doesn't apply in this case to remedy that situation. <laughs> it does because it's even more complicated than we've even we've even touched on here. Because there's this whole other ecosystem about collateral that we haven't even scratched the surface of. Because treasury securities or any form of collateral isn't just a one-to-one. -one. It isn't this, say, I own a treasury bill and then I, I let you have it and you use it in the repo market and then that's fine. Um, I might have a treasury bill or a treasury security that I borrowed from somebody else who borrowed the same security from somebody else, who borrowed the same security from somebody else, who borrowed the same security from somebody else, who borrowed it from somebody else and somebody else, somebody else. Rehypothecation of, of collateral. Of collateral. So you have supply factors as well as supply factors in the dealer and the money monetary system, as well as supply factors from the U.S. Treasury, supply factors from the Federal Reserve taking out uh, collateral. And so the simple answer is, say the Fed removes $300 billion in Treasury bills, then we would just need a little bit more reuse rate in the dealer market to replace them. We'll just lend them out a little bit more. So the Fed takes $350 billion out of supply, then dealers step in and reuse and repledge and rehypothecate $350 billion more. They've essentially conjured that hole and made up the off it offset the deficit with their own activities. But again, what is the secret sauce here? It requires the dealers to want to do that. And so if the Fed is taking treasury bills and the dealers say, no, I don't want to rehypothecate and reuse because I'm nervous, I'm risk averse, whatever. Then the Fed reduces the supply and the dealer system, the, the, the collateral system does not replace it. Then you've got a problem because usually if the dealers are becoming risk averse, they don't want to re reuse and repledge and rehypothecate the same rate they did before. That usually is when demand for collateral, demand for the best collateral is going up. So you have lack of elasticity and that's really the problem here in these collateral chains. Hence reverse elasticity. Okay. Now I've, yes. now I've got it. Got it. Okay. So, um, and it's like, I said, it's even, it's that's just, you know, these are overly simplified examples. It's even more complicated and complex than that. 